Here's a great way to spend the weekend. You're in a podcast studio. You're amongst good people. And look at all this. Mm. It's a beautiful sight that we present to you here. We put it on display for you because I'm about to put this man in a very uncomfortable position. <laughs> By the way, I'm Rob Akinpour. You're welcome to be a part of the A-game. Um, usually, you're on the other side on your own podcast. Yes, yes. <laughs> Point Blank Podcast. i got to give that a prop here from a shared universe. But uh, John has a little sideline. It's called uh, Ross Brewing, which is starting to take off. And he's branched out into the cider industry mm -hmm. for this holiday season. John Ross Gigazzo, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Rob. Uh, you're, you're not wrong. Uh, <laughs> I, I've sometimes, you know, Wednesday nights, I physically sit in this seat. Right. But I'm the one asking the questions. So it feels <laughs> weird to be on the other side of it, so I to speak. would feel the same way because I'm so used to being the interviewer. If right. somebody were to interview me, I'd be like, no, 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 no. no. Can, we, can we focus around on these? Right. <laughs> but it's, I think it's important because what's happening with your company, it's really starting to take off. Obviously, this is the beginning. Yes. Because to launch in New Jersey and really corner New Jersey and the tri-state area, then the next step, obviously, is to try to be like a lot of these microbrew companies and try to go national. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a painstaking process, is it not? It is. Each state has their own unique set of rules right. uh, and processes that you have to follow. And um, in our case, uh, even though we're based right here in Monmouth County, New Jersey, uh, I live five minutes away. The brewery is about 10 minutes away. Right. Um, just because of those different rules... Our license to sell in New York actually came in first, Rob. Oh, that's so, weird. So okay. we've been selling in New York since uh, since December of last year, mm -hmm. and we've been selling in New Jersey now for the last month, finally. Finally. Yeah. yeah. That's got to be a good feeling. At least now it's like, oh, I can go to my liquor store. Yes. I can get it. Exactly. Yes. You get it, man. You get it. You get it. You get it. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I was happy to post this up on Facebook, and a lot of people were already asking, like, hey, that looks great. Where can I get it? That's a really good sign, too. I mean, the word is out on you guys. There's no doubt about that. Where they've gone into some bars and they've seen Ross. Yep, yep. So now to go into the liquor store and be able to take, as you can see, these four packs home with you, these beautifully displayed beers, by the way. And I did notice you put like four. Can they do a mix pack? I mean, especially so, so, with the holidays, so, I was thinking that's a great gift. So that is entirely up to the individual retailer. Mm -hmm. We've seen certain retailers, such as the uh, the Saltwater Market down in Asbury, mm -hmm. where they let you do mix four packs, mix six packs. Nice. So they sell the cans individually. Other places like you to keep four and sixes together. Right. It's really all down to it. I, I happen to know a place they asked not to be promoted, which is a shame because I'd love to promote them. Oh, sure. This is but, what it's all about, man. But, uh, <laughs> But they said uh, if somebody asks, they'll do it for them. Right. So I would just tell uh, you know your listeners, uh, just ask. It sure doesn't hurt. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, when you think about beer, when we were growing up, because I think we were right around the same age, mm -hmm. so you think about it. The first time we kind of saw a beer commercial, think about the 1970s, and we're seeing, like, okay, Schaefer, yeah. Rheingold, Schlitz. Uh, that's the one beer to have when you're having more than one. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I can remember being a kid, and actually, because my grandpa, Grandpa Derrico, yeah. was, like, the guy who would sit there watching Mets game, mm -hmm. crack open a Schaefer. And yes. I remember tasting this, and I'm like, and like spitting it out. I you, mean, you, you know what's funny? Uh, Schaefer was my grandmother's beer. All right, oh, wow. my, my grandmother, she would drink <laughs> with the with the best of them, and Schaefer was her beer. And uh, and she actually had all kinds of Schaefer swag and stuff. Oh, so wow, it, yeah, that was they've become collectors' items now. I've yeah, noticed exactly. That. Yeah, exactly. Then after that, then you go to the '80s and you have uh, taste great, less filling. Yeah, the and whole Miller Lite thing really took off. At absolutely, that point. absolutely. But the microbrew thing, I can remember. 2000s, but it really was starting in the 90s because when I was working down in Delaware, dogfish yes, yeah. really started to explode when I got down around 2001. So but it was around like in the mid-90s. That, that was probably the first big uh, mass explosion. The first what we think of as craft breweries mm -hmm. started early 80s. Okay. You basically had three there. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you had... Uh, uh, Jim Coke of, up at uh, Sam Adams. Sam Adams, definitely. And then you had Ken Grossman out at Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the guy that was there for a little longer was Fritz over at Anchor Brewing. But those I three Anchor, yeah. kind of were like the first foray into it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it took a while. It took until the 90s where brands started to become more recognizable. You mentioned Dogfish Head. Yeah. I mean, they've done a great job. They've built up an amazing brand. And uh, you know what happened uh, last year? is uh, That yeah, $300 million it, deal. Oh, my good deal. goodness. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. So he's down. They're part of uh, Boston Beer Co. just yeah. there with Sam Adams. 
And uh, the interesting thing there, what we're really happy about as just beer fans, mm -hmm. is that Sam Cuglione, the owner brewer there, he said, hey, I'm staying on board because now joining forces with Sam, who knows where we can take this? Right. And they're getting more creative with access to rarer ingredients. Mm -hmm. So uh, listen, we're a long way off. We're, 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 we're a month <laughs> into this here, but uh, but certainly we have ambition, but right? It, yeah, exactly. It's got to be an encouraging start, though, because you see how the industry has just in the last 20 years mm -hmm. exploded. And when you see a deal like that, and Founders was another one. Yes, yes. Nine 90% of the company sold, I think it was almost along the same amount of money yes, as yes. Dogfish Head got. They sold to a Spanish beer giant. Yeah. Um, and uh, what was very interesting to me in the announcements there is that the two founders, they stayed on. Yeah. They each kept 5%. Right. And then to your point, 90% was acquired. Mm -hmm. But what they said is where they were so happy was for their investors. They said, our investors, they've been with us for day one. Wow. You know, think about it, it was friends, family. Mm -hmm. And they said they've never gotten a dime from us until now, which was mind blowing to me because you think of founders. I yeah. Mean, they're big. You know, they're, they're they're making money already. Yeah. But kind of that was the deal is all the investors said, keep all the money in, right. grow the place mm -hmm. until one day we can sell. And so uh, we kind of conditioned our investors as well. Hey, listen, that would be ideal one day. Mm -hmm. But if the worst thing is we've got a great local brewery right. and we're making beer and we can enjoy it and, and see it everywhere that we go out, that'd be pretty cool too. John Ross Cacazzo is the founder of Ross Brewing and he's here on the A-Game. Um, the thing that I'm noticing too, uh, and I think the first sign of flavoring in the beer, for me, that was Samuel Adams' cherry wheat beer. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. That was the one that kind of just like, oh my God, where's this been all my life? Yes. But I never thought beer and flavoring would actually work together and that's become more popular than ever before. You almost can't keep up with it, Rob, because uh, it started out that cherry wheat great. Yeah. They did another one on the, around the holidays. They would do a honey porter, yes. Sam Adams. That was another favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, But yes, more and more breweries started adding, whether it was fruit flavors yeah. or, or chocolate flavors or other kinds of flavors. And now it's almost Every other beer has, right. you know, it's, we, we, we have a beer here in front of us, right? I was about to say, the Manasquan Wit mm -hmm. is a great example of what we're talking about. Now, this is basically your version of a Belgian white, but it has orange zest. It's got a little bit of lemon and cucumber, which is an interesting combination. Okay, so this one's not cucumber. Okay. We, we actually do have, this one has a coriander. The coriander, spice. okay. We do have a cucumber beer as well, though, oh, so it's okay. interesting you said that. That's funny. But, um... In this case, you know, the Belgian white, you mentioned it, right? And the two ones I think that it might be best known to people would be on a craftier side, like an Allagash white. Yeah. And on a more of a mass side, like a blue moon. Yeah. And so uh, if you can imagine a spectrum between those, we're somewhere in the middle on that spectrum, mm -hmm. probably about 80% towards Allagash, 20% towards blue moon, because I still wanted people to be able to pick it up. You don't have to be a craft beer snob. No. Exactly. So, uh, so yeah, good flavors there. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to try this when I get home. That's for sure this is going to be chilled and i'm going to enjoy that yep interesting you mentioned blue moon because i think the one thing that kind of stood out is that they're taking it one step further it's like now they're putting mango in the beer and yep. it's like it, are we going too far in your opinion or is there no boundaries when it comes to craft beer so the answer to both of those questions is yes okay. how is that possible right so, <laughs> so uh sometimes you, you you wake up in the morning you know you're, you're reading the craft beer news uh which is something that you know i i do and you're like Okay, they just did a, a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich pilsner. Okay, like, are we going too far? <laughs> I absolutely recognize that. And, you know, I think about guys like my dad and my father in law, right. you know, work with us at the brewery. And, you know, I think the most exciting thing he did is when he, he you know, when he was doing a steak dinner, instead of a Budweiser, it would be a Heineken. Okay. okay? But now, like, it's almost unrecognizable. At the same time, I say, go for it. The right. audience will tell you when you've gone too okay, far. Okay, that's fair. Right? If that's you make fair. something bananas and nobody mm -hmm. wants to buy it, yeah. then you take a step back. Well, because I'm noticing, like, what did I see recently? I wrote it down on my, uh, banana bread mm. beer. And I'm going, okay. Mm, I don't I, know. I haven't had that one. All right. It's an interesting one that I kind of went, really? Maybe that would be a good dessert beer. Okay. Maybe. And, right. and that's the other thing. We're noticing that the bottling of beers now mm -hmm. have become almost to the point of, like, wine. Yes. The yes. bottling of, like, wine. For sure. So it, do you think that actually helps some of these breweries? It does help you get into uh, places where beer wouldn't ordinarily be served. Okay, okay so we're in some surprisingly high-end restaurants up in the city um, that five years ago would have never served beer. Okay. But now the price points have actually, believe it or not, crept up to the point where they can recognize its value. Right. And uh, there's also been a, a, a movement, a push, for um, you know, gourmands to recognize, hey, listen, beer has 
for setting aside all those additional ingredients we just spoke about. Sure. Beer has four core ingredients. Okay, water, yeast, barley, and hops. And um, in wine, it's two, the grapes and the yeast. Right. And so um, there's been a lot of push by the Brewers Association to get restaurants and chefs to recognize, hey, they'll never, we'll never say anything bad about wine. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I love wine. My wife loves wine. We all yeah, sure. we'll, we'll never say anything bad about wine. it. Absolutely. They said, but just... With the number of ingredients in beer, it gives more opportunities for food pairings. And then you start adding things like banana bread right. or whatever else we're talking about. <laughs> so, yes, uh, they're, they're, they're definitely, it's getting recognized. Mm -hmm. It's getting a seat at the table, a little bit more, no longer at the kids' table. Right, only. right. Uh, not that kids should be drinking, of course. No, but. no, no. We're not encouraging that. Must, must be over 21 to drink. Be, be responsible. There, there you go. go. Wow. There, the we'll put you to work there, Rob. I'm a professional of some sort. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I will actually put him to work. Let's talk about the harvest because this is a little sure. different for you guys. Yes, and going into the cider bit of this. Mm -hmm. Yep. When it comes to, I mean, we've seen a lot of hard ciders, and that's another thing that's really become yep. Magners and so many yep. others that have really become very popular. So, yep. what made you decide to say, you know what, we're going to expand a little bit and uh, give this a shot for the season? So sure, to speak. sure. So, first of all, it was. Um, Partly, I, what, what did they say to uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, right? Why yes. did you uh, uh, climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. Mm -hmm. We wanted to try to see if we could, to see if we could pull it off. Fair enough. Because it was a little outside of our comfort zone. Right. We've been brewing beer for a long time. Right. You know, my wife couldn't wait for the brewery to open because she wanted to get all the brewing equipment out of our garage, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, but cider was going to be something new for us. Okay. Um, you know, there's a number of members of the family, the extended Ross family, that mm -hmm. uh, for one reason or another, they're doing gluten-free. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. beer... Traditional beer is gluten. It's made with malted barley. It has that same protein just like wheat does. Right. But but cider is completely gluten-free naturally. Mm -hmm. And then there's some gluten-free beers we're developing with some alternate grains such as sorghum. But that's down the line. In any right. event. So, but I, for you, man, yeah, sure. I would imagine that's going to take a lot of doing in the sense of you want to get the right taste. hundred percent. Yeah. So that, there's exactly. A, that, exactly that's probably more of a time consuming until we get that formula right. Exactly right. Exactly right. Now, cider, uh, the processes are in place. And in this case, we wanted to partner with somebody that we had high confidence that could execute our vision. Mm -hmm. So... Um, uh, there's a number of apple orchards right here in the state. Oh, yeah. And there's a few cideries in the state. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, none of them had the capacity to work with us in terms of the volume we wanted to do. That's interesting because here, anybody, if you know Jersey, yep. I mean, we we kind of grew up around Delicious Orchards, yep. which is a it, very big place for apples. First place I went to. Okay, okay yeah. you would have figured, absolutely. Uh, Route 34 over yeah. in Colts Neck. Um, and of course, uh, and just in terms of apples, if we're talking about Monmouth County, you got to talk about Laird's. Laird, okay, oh, they, Laird's Applejack, of course. They've been doing, they've been they've been doing, doing the Applejack since the 1700s. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, George Washington's favorite drink. <laughs> it's so true. It's they said true. it helped them get through that winter, uh, 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 <laughs> Valley Forge. But in any event, um, so so we wound up finding a place. Mm -hmm. um, they had a 150-year history. They're called the Soons Apple Orchards. Okay. And it's right over the New Jersey border into upstate New York. Nice. Um, like if you're going to Woodbury Commons, you mm -hmm. would almost pass this place. Okay. And uh, so on site, they have a cider mill, the Orchard Hill Cider Mill. We sat down with them. I explained my concept, what mm -hmm. I wanted to do. I wanted to make a crisp cider. Right. At seven percent, so even a beer drinker can right. enjoy it. And it's a, yeah, seven percent alcohol. And uh, are we come six point nine? Six point nine. Yeah. Wow, seven percent. And there's a reason there. I'll tell you about that in a oh, second. All right, all right. But then uh, I wanted to because we wanted to use fresh fall harvest apples. Mm -hmm. I said let let's let it also feel or taste a little bit like going apple picking. And so we put a, a mix of fall spices that we came up. You're with right. Here. Now and did that's you, exactly, you pick I got, up any I got, of that? I got picked up on that right away. Awesome, that's, awesome. It's interesting you're saying that. It's like that's exactly what, in that one sip. It's like you and it's that. It hits you. Yes. And it yes. hits you nice. It's a nice hit. It's not overpowering. That that was the goal. We yeah. didn't we didn't want it to be in your face. Right. Like, oh my God, this is all spice, spice, spice. Right. I want to let the apples speak for themselves. And let and, and we use a mix of about six different apple varieties on this that we selected. Right. And then sort of on the back end, oh well that's nice. Yeah. So and I'm catching it's not overly sweet. So when you're talking about the six different apples, I'm I'm thinking it was a mixture of tart, sweet, and maybe even a little sour. So so that's very astute of you. You've got a great palate, Rob. Thank you. So, um, in general, um, ciders are graded like wines on mm -hmm. a scale from sweet to dry. Okay. And what that refers to, and we'll just give this little bit of education here to the, to, to the yeah, listeners please, and viewers. Please, yeah. Um, 
During the process, in wine, it's grapes, in this case, apples, mm -hmm. obviously they, they produce sugar, right? We know that uh, fruit sugar is called fructose. Yeah. And the yeast eats that sugar, and the yeasts poop out alcohol, okay? And, right. that's, and that's brewing and, and, and fermenting. Welcome there to Brewing go. 101. There you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, so depending on how much of that sugar the, the, the yeasts eat, Right. That, that determines how much is left in the cider or the wine. Mm -hmm. And cider is essentially apple wine. So if you leave a lot in there so it can taste that sweetness, you would call that a sweet wine or a sweet cider. Okay, yeah. And there's examples of sweet ciders. Uh, oh, yeah. Sweet wine would be like a Riesling or a Moscato, something yes, like that. Yes, very much so, yeah. Well, uh, and so it, you, you can have sweet, semi-sweet, you know, semi-dry, dry. So we went semi-dry here. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want it to be overbearingly sweet. Mm -hmm. And correspondingly, we did pick apples that would go along with that. Okay. So good call. Yeah, and, and, that, and it is not, and that's the other thing that I noticed. You're saying semi-dry, that's a great, that describes. It. It's not overly dry. And I'm not right. a fan of overly dry. That's I agree. Yeah. I agree. That that was we thought that was the sweet spot. Now I will say this. We're having a sweeter cider come out mm -hmm. in the spring okay. for sale in the spring and summer season. And that is our Ross pink rose cider. Interesting. Okay. okay. So uh we're using different types of apples, sweeter apples. Mm -hmm. And then as well, we're enhancing it with uh some hibiscus, mm -hmm. uh some rose petals, and uh and a few other surprises that I'll I'll wait till the beer comes out. I don't want to reveal the whole thing now. Right. But that would that would be then for that, that audience mm -hmm. that maybe is looking for something sweeter. And again, it's pink, it's rose, it's bubbly, we use cool. a different yeast. It, it's it's nice. Good stuff. The harvest is available right now. Yes. is really good for the holiday season. There's another thing you have available. Ming, the, the photo I think is I think it's called gooseberry. If I'm not mistaken, gooseberry. Am I getting right? Yeah, we go. Oh, there you go. Now so, that's the mixed berry so sour. I yes. Mean, what is that like? Because we don't have it here. So give me give it a little description. Sure. So uh, so first thing is that's going to be available statewide in about ten days from today. Looking forward to it. Okay. And uh, we've got uh, fifteen locations that have signed up to carry that. Okay. So uh, that's going to be everywhere. We tell people go to the website. Uh, at rossbrewing.com there's a beer finder and you know you, it's interactive with google maps you can see where you are you can see where the closest place is now this gets to exactly what you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. you know um the evolution of the industry uh, i can remember as recently as seven years ago the concept of sour beers in the u.s mm. was not something with mass appeal no. the belgians have always done great with it and uh and, and you know they're innovators in the beer you know the, the the beer sphere as are the germans and the british and the irish right mm -hmm. but um but but i guess about that time you started to see more sour beers appearing here then again in the last let's say three years, mm -hmm. the accent became on fruited sours because the sweetness of the fruit can cut some of the sour. There we go. That makes sense. And so that was our goal here. Um, but we're doing something a little bit different because this is what we do at Ross. We, we, mm -hmm. If we see something's working, we're going to take it and we're going to tweak it a bit. Okay. So the reason it's called Gooseberry, it's sort of a pun. Uh, the style of sour we use is a number of sours. We went with a German style called a Goza. Okay, so okay. all kinds of sours. There's mm -hmm. a Berliner Weiss. There's a Flanders Oud Bruin. This is a Goza. It's it's a um, uh, traditional German sour style that's typically made with salt, sea salt, okay, and and uh, coriander. So to that Goza. We then added a fruit that's grown right here in New Jersey, which are gooseberries. Mm, okay. okay, there's the play on words. Exactly. There we go. <laughs> so, so gooseberries uh, themselves are not always the sweetest fruit. Matter of fact, if you're picking them just past ripeness, there's a sourness to them. The yeah. sweet has gone so far as to become sour. So we wanted to get the gooseberries that were just a little bit past ripe. Mm -hmm. So get a little bit of that sourness. Right. And then because we are in the Garden State and we're in Monmouth County where right. there's berry farms all over the oh, place, there is. we threw some locally locally grown uh, raspberries and blackberries as well. So it's a okay. mixed berry sour. Hmm. And uh, I can tell you in testing, people, people really love this. People that aren't right. beer drinkers mm -hmm. loved it because they're like very hard to define what is this it's, right there's some sweetness there's some sour it's it's a very bubbly uh effervescent type of thing so we think uh we hope anyway that it's right. going to be received well good stuff i guess the the one question that stands out with all of this is that you obviously have a passion for it but how does that come to fruition that you mm. kind of go Okay, I love beer. Right. The idea, you know what? Maybe I can open a brewing company. Uh, well, you, you got to have a couple of screws loose to begin with. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, we were we were doing it as a hobby, home brewing. Okay. That, see, all right. Yeah. That's what I was thinking, you yeah. know, because there's so many home brewing kits out there yes, now, yes. and you can clown around. But obviously, in the clowning around, something came about that went, we maybe have something here. 
Well, you're, you're, you're exactly right. I had, um, prior to this, and always concurrent with my day job, my, my, my day career, I had always had a little bit of an entrepreneurial bug. Mm-hmm. I opened a craft beer bar and pub here in Monmouth County, up okay. in Matawan. I opened a second one over in Staten Island, New York. Mm-hmm. And my day job was also in manufacturing. So I said, if I can combine my passion for craft beer sales, Mm -hmm. right, with the pubs, uh, with what I've learned and picked up at my manufacturing job, Mm -hmm. with my hobby of home brewing, and put all those three together, why haven't I opened a brewery yet? Right. Uh, And my wife gave me a list of reasons. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure she did. But um, like going, Han, you know, this may not be the wisest idea. (laughs) But uh, but ultimately, we won her over. Uh, We wrote up a business plan. Actually, I went back to school and and got a master's um, in, in and got my MBA very specifically to learn how to write the right business plan for this type of business. Oh wow! Okay. And uh, once that was done, uh, we we set to work securing investors, and we're on our way. It's funny because I came up with the name the A game with the show, basically tapping into people who are achieving their goals. You're mm-hmm. a great example of that. You took the bull by the horns, and you're starting to achieve, hopefully, the beginning of an empire. Obviously, it's exciting just to be at this level and just kind of go. We've got something. Yep. And one other thing, they're going to go on the website. We know that things can be, can this be mailed or is that not legal in Jersey? That's something that I was always curious about. So, so we'll talk about pre COVID first. Okay. Okay. So pre COVID, no, absolutely. That's what I thought. Right. You you absolutely cannot mail. Now during COVID times, different state legislatures have again, Mm -hmm. come up with different rules to help breweries try to get through this. Like all industries are having a hard time right now. Absolutely. So what New Jersey did is they still said, no, you can't mail it. If you have a physical brewery, what you can do is home deliveries of beer. Okay. So our physical location mm-hmm. uh, is under construction right now right. in Middletown, New Jersey, mm-hmm. just about uh, you know about 20 minutes north of here, mm-hmm. 15, 20 minutes. And um, so once that's open, besides people being able to come to our brewery, mm-hmm. then we will now qualify for that rule if it's still in place. Sure. Because it was originally granted for six months mm-hmm. and that expired. Okay. All the breweries said, guys, guys, like COVID's not cured. Right, people right. still can't come out. Mm-hmm. So the state legislature, surprisingly and thankfully, they extended it by another six months. Nice. So now the push is on, hey, can we make this permanent? Right. So uh, that next expiration is probably right around the time when we'll be opening our doors. So if we have the ability to do that, that would be that would be great. If not, there is a fallback. Okay. And I'll talk to you about that. It's There's numerous websites and services Mm -hmm. that are domiciled in different states and which have different rules in new jersey's Mm -hmm. crazy rules and uh one of them uh for example tavor okay so it's t-a-v-o-u-r tavor.com there's a tavor app and um their whole goal is to try to bring you local craft beers that you can't get by you so um we're endeavoring to get on their site they've got some pretty strict criteria they want to know that your beers Mm -hmm. On the beer review app known as Untapped, mm-hmm. um, they want to know that you've got at least a hundred reviews, and that your beers have at least a four point rating. Now, when you talk about hundred reviews, we talking yeah. about reviews from bars, critics. Where are these reviews coming from? Sure. So, uh, so Untapped is is sort of the beer drinkers app. Uh, these guys, I mean. We talked about the rise of craft beer. Yeah. It's also the rise of all the ancillary businesses that go along with craft beer. Okay. So, yeah. so let's say you um, were growing uh, something, cucumbers on your farm, and they weren't selling. You became a hop farm now. Now you're, they're selling like hotcakes, right? Because right. all the breweries need hops. Right. So Untapped was an app that would, at one point, let you go to a bar and check in and just say what beer you're drinking. And what happened is it became the de facto uh, um you know, like one-stop place for all things craft beer. Wow. So now... You can go to a bar. Right. You can you can go to a store, buy beer, right? Mm-hmm. Or you can get it at a shared universe studio. Right. Go home and from your couch you can check in, <laughs> and you can say, okay, I'm enjoying this beer. They encourage people to post pictures of the beer you're right. drinking. It's not quite a social network, but mm-hmm. it's a hybrid between a review app and a social network. So so th- if you are a fan of Ross Brewing, then then encourage them to probably go oh, there yes. and give the give the reviews because if you are a fan and give it a high review, and then it would help you get to another level. Thousand percent, Rob. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. We we we, we ask you know the viewers the listeners if uh if you've if you've had a ross beer and you feel that we deserve it go mm-hmm. ahead and give us that five rating uh you know four and three quarters is acceptable as well uh <laughs> but but again you know really if, if you enjoy the beer we appreciate it and uh once we have enough of them right then we turn to a service like tavor and say okay we've met your criteria because here's the thing we've got fans of ross mm-hmm. 
all across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we've got people from Chicago, from Omaha, Nebraska, from uh, the West Coast, and they're saying, when can we get the beer? Speaking of fans, uh, Ming, I I'm going to put you to work. There's a photo of uh, two people that are kind of famous there. Speaking of famous people who happen to like Ross beer, that's the one. Click on that, will you? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that is Ming Shen. That's my boss from Comic Book Man. He runs a shared universe. The other guy, yeah, you might recognize Method Man. That is the Method Man. That is yes. the Method Man. Speaking of fans of you. So, uh, so it's, it, you know, it's an interesting story there. Uh, we definitely have Ming to thank for the picture. Um, you know, Method Man appeared on Comic Book Men, uh, which, of course, yes. uh, Ming and Mike and, and the rest of the team uh, had that show on AMC for many years. And maybe mm -hmm. it'll be coming back one day. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. And um, but 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 coincidentally, Method Man and I actually had known each other even longer than that. Oh, get and, out And when here. Ming put that together, he did not even know that. That's how coincidental <laughs> it was. I um so I grew up in Staten Island, New York, mm -hmm. and and as did Method Man and uh, and many of the Wu Tang Clan. Matter of fact, the high school I went to, Curtis High School, uh, RZA, uh, Ghostface, a lot of the guys had, had had come through there, and so we were different years, but uh, we all knew people that knew each other. That's crazy. Now, fast forward after high school, I'm in college, and I'm working at a store in the Staten Island Mall called Comic Attitudes. Okay. And every Wednesday, without fail. Your boy right there, oh, met the man, man with there. That is great. He was a huge <laughs> fan of the whole Ghost Rider franchise, mm -hmm. but he liked Marvel Comics in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was there. Matter of fact, if you look at their second album, Wu Tang Forever, mm -hmm. they have a, a shout out to us in the liner notes. A shout out to the crew at Comic Attitudes. That's very cool. So uh, I show that to my kids, and they and I think they think I'm cool, and they're like, "Well, who's the Wu Tang?" So yeah. obviously, obviously, I got some work to do, Rob. But. Um, but yeah, so uh, so of course, uh, uh, you know, he was there. I think he had a pretty cool hat on. And Ming <laughs> asked him, least. well, I was going to say, Ming <laughs> asked him if he can look at that hat. And he goes, keep it. He goes, but then can I have that hat that you're wearing, uh -huh. which was a Ross Brewing hat. So that's how he became a Ross. And, and again, the connection that you already had, it's like, oh, man, slam dunk. It, it is, it's crazy, for sure. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, I'll actually, I'll tease this only because you, you, you put that picture up. Right. I, I wouldn't have brought this up otherwise. There's a, another member of the uh of the wu-tang clan family okay mm -hmm. and that is the rizza okay um when i had um i, I had i mentioned i had a few bars uh, one of them was in Staten Island. he would pop in on random saturday nights to um to dj a set in our club room oh, i mean man. you can't get any better than that <laughs> yeah. so we've stayed in contact uh -huh. and uh there, we're in the preliminary stages mm -hmm. but we're talking about would he want to collaborate on a wu-tang beer or a rizza oh, beer that's and a he cool said, idea yeah and he said but I have to design the label. And I'm like, yeah, you sure. Design whatever, whatever you want. Knock yourself out. Exactly. Do it. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So we're trying to, we're trying to land that. And, That's fantastic. Uh, we'll keep everyone posted. Absolutely. Yeah. John Ross Cucazzo is the founder of Ross Brewing. He is here on the A-game. He also is a part of the Point Blank Bod podcast. So mm -hmm. he's in a very unfamiliar role being interviewed right now. So I appreciate you being out of, of your comfort zone. Of course. You obviously love doing this because you, you go on Point Blank. on uh, You're on a regular basis over there. We, we, we are Wednesday. Wednesday nights, uh, we say 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific. Right. Uh, it, it's nominally a weekly show. On average, we do three out of four weeks. Right. Uh, because at, at some point, uh, Mike and Ming get a little fed up, so uh, we give them a week <laughs> off, and then we restart. <laughs> it makes the bit that, no, we don't. We don't. <laughs> no, he gets fed up with me. Because he, he puts up with my crap like, oh, God, I can pour us get another guest. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> at least it's, it's from John Ross. All right, we, we, we know him. That's all right. <laughs> and he, he's like going... He's got like five coming up. <laughs> you poor bastard. That's all I'm going to tell you. All right, up to random shots. This is my segment where I do a little bit of a, sure. a, yeah, a look at um, some of the things that John has on his Facebook page. I thought this was the perfect way to do random shots. Plus, I had responded on one of his posts recently, so it kind of sets up beautifully. And if you don't follow John on Facebook, it's worth it because it seems like once a week he's always putting up some kind of top three list mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that he's doing. So a couple of them have come up here. And... I got to start with this because you were talking about Sean Connery yeah. on your uh, Facebook page. So who was the best Bond in your mind? Was it Connery or was it somebody else? So uh, I probably have a little bit different take. Well, you said we're, we're about the same age, but but for me growing up, mm -hmm. the Bond at the time was Roger, Roger Moore. Moore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So those were the movies that were always first and foremost. Now, my dad's yeah. like, no, you want to see Bond. You've got to see, see Connery. Yeah. So, of course, I love those movies as well. Mm -hmm. Um you know, uh, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan, they got a little wackier. <laughs> um, but Daniel Craig, for me, has really brought it home. Casino Royale, I, I hate to say it. As much as I don't want to make it number one on my list of Bond movies, it's become it's become my all-time favorite. Yep. It really has. And, and I'm, you know, 
obviously we've lost many things during COVID. Yes, we have, as a matter of fact. And, you know, people have lost family members, Mm -hmm. businesses have unfortunately gone out of business, but the movie industry, right? And so it's a wash for 2020. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we lost the latest Bond, Bond 25, uh, uh, No Time to Die. But I think uh, they're going to be coming out, I guess, rescheduling it to be released next year. Correct. So looking forward to that. Definitely looking forward to that. Um, this was an interesting one that I found on your Facebook page. Top three Disney movies of all time. What mm. were your top three? Because I wrote down my top three and I'll share in a second. Okay, I'll, t- I'll tell you my top three. Uh, mm. uh, it's a little bit different, my list. As no we, problem. We, learned, we wound up talking about that on Point Blank. And yeah, that's why a, I'm going to a, it. A, a, that was- everyone had you know sort of either traditional maybe Disney animation movies mm-hmm. or even Disney live action movies. My top three were Tron. Okay. okay. Can't argue that. Um, uh, Miracle, which was the uh, oh, the, 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 the hockey, team, hockey, team, hockey team, hockey movie. team. I forgot about that was a Disney movie. It's very good. And I might get a lot of shit from your. I'm sorry. Let us. You're allowed to say okay, shit. It's right. a podcast. All Come right. <laughs> but uh, my number three was actually High School Musical. Uh, let me explain before you think I'm crazy. I'm leaving. Uh, See ya. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. When my kids were young. They right, fair, had this fair, on, fair. Rob, 24 Four hours a day, yeah. <laughs> all the time. And you know what? These catchy songs get in your head, and yeah. next thing you know, my wife's falling for Zac Efron. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I think they did a good job with right. it. That launched a franchise. But you could pick almost any three Disney no, movies ever. What are yours? Now here, here's what I came up with, and, and it's one of those up, because the 10 minutes oh, of that yeah, movie, yeah. Oh, God. I defy anybody to watch the anthology of yep. watching mm. that couple Go through yep. all the phases, and you're not crying at the end of it. Of course, how could you not? Wally, even though there's not it just there's something just so beautiful mm-hmm. about Wally. Absolutely. But the last one was because of my childhood, and I remember seeing this movie in the theater. Escape to Witch oh, Mountain. Yes. That got that got a lot of votes, man. And I'm not surprised. Yes, because that's one of those films that from our generation as yep. kids it just sticks out, and we can't believe that what's her face is now on the Real Housewives yeah. of Beverly Hills. Exactly. Really? <laughs> and, and what was great too when we were kids, mm-hmm. we used to have a lot less channels, guys. Of True. course, yeah, exactly. But there was always the Wide World of Disney on Sunday nights. Yes, and then I would we had seen Escape to Witch Mountain in the theaters, and mm-hmm. I couldn't have been like maybe. Four or five, yeah. but then get to see it again on that Sunday. Right. It was so exciting. <laughs> uh, but I noticed the other two you picked, Pixar. Yes, and they've just they do a great job. They do a great everything, job. Everything, man. Mm-hmm. It's not just the animation, the story, mm-hmm. but the emotion. And I think that's why you picked the ones oh, you did. It, it was total emotion. One question: When you were doing that type of day, anybody pick Gus the field goal kicking mule? Uh, did not make the <laughs> did list. Not make did not make the list. list. Oh, damn that. We, we, we always do one that's like Mr. Irrelevant, a.k.a. Like who, okay. who got the least amount of votes. Right. And I think the movie Peach Dragon got a vote. And I think that one, that one I think was last place. But uh, there, were, there were no field goal <laughs> No kicking field goal kicking mules. I'm disappointed in that. <laughs> this is something I responded to on John's Facebook page. So I'm taking it one step further on this. Okay. Biggest crushes you were growing up. Ming, I'm going to set up the two photos. Was it from... The Karate Kid 1, Elizabeth Shue, who was adorable back then, or Karate Kid 2's Tamlin Tamita. Wow. So, yes, I recognize the picture because... uh uh, you're right. I did just post about her. Yes. She, I, I couldn't believe that in like the latest season of uh, Star Trek Picard, yes. that she's playing this. Uh, this. Uh, l- l- I'm not going to spoil it, but you know she plays a key role in, in yeah, the she series. She does. And um, so, based purely on which one I had a bigger crush on at mm-hmm. the moment, I actually am going to go with Karate Kid 2's Tamlin Tamita. Um, uh, much like uh, our very own Ming Chen, she had an air of exoticism to yes. her that I was not familiar with previously. And uh, I mean, that said, right. Elizabeth Chu, uh, she was America's uh, sweetheart. Yeah, I, between that and Adventures in Babysitting, yes, yes, I was yes, totally yes. smitten with her. But the turning point with me and Tamlin Tamita was the Joy Luck Club. And you watch how uh, she just, yeah. she was gorgeous. You're just sitting there going, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, 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 yes. I, I know. Wipe the drool. Thank you. Uh, embarrassing. But she, she's, she's stunning. And, you know, I know yep. they're both over 50 now and they're both looking fantastic. Yep. And there's talk maybe that we'll be seeing Elizabeth Shue's character of Allie come back in Cobra Kai season three. Freak, yeah, a lot I'm, of rumors. Oh my god, have you have you watched all two seasons? Of oh yes, yeah, yes, okay, yes. good. Watch mm-hmm. the watch the whole thing uh, through twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there you go. What you did during COVID? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Random shots with John Roscoe Cazzo. Okay, um, this was the one I liked that you posted. Bottom three TV series finales. Mm, yes, rather than a top three, that was a bottom three. Bottom three in this case, yes. 
Well, you know why? Because there's a lot of great series. Right. And, and the way they go out sometimes uh, leaves that taste in your mouth exactly. going, Exactly. How dare you? Exactly. Uh, I mean, the, the first one that comes to mind for me was Lost. Um, that didn't really do it for me. Right. Uh, this may be unpopular to say, say in the state of New Jersey here, but Sopranos. Sopranos. I'm sure they got a lot of votes from you it, were it talking did, about it that. Did, yeah. It did. It did. Um, there were a few others, but those two actually got more than than anybody else. And you know who else rounded out the top three, believe it or not, mm -hmm. was Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Interesting. Because they had a, a, a series finale that sort of was the payoff. They brought back all the characters exactly. from the seven seasons, mm -hmm. but people just felt like it was too... I guess people, I mean, I didn't vote for that, but people mm -hmm. just felt this maybe it was too gimmicky. Maybe. So, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and it, it's interesting because it was just announced by Showtime that Dexter's going to do a new season in 2021. And that obviously is their way of saying, no, we really didn't wrap up the show that well. Yeah, they messed up. Man. Oh, my they God. I mean, I was addicted to that show, so mm -hmm. I'm actually very happy to hear that. Yep. This one only because I've been, it's weird. I get up in the morning, I'm getting ready to go to my other job, mm -hmm. and I'm like, there's me TV, and all my three sons are on. Oh, and I okay. remember just watching it in reruns, and recently they showed the last episode, and I'm like, oh, that's the last episode? It almost, it, then I read about it. They were actually planning another season. CBS pulled the plug that they couldn't do a farewell season. So in a weird way, my three sons had the worst possible. Sure, because they never got a chance to, right. to say goodbye properly. They never got mm. that. And, and you think 13 seasons on the air, you don't get a chance to say goodbye properly. That's, that's, that's kind of a shame. Then I went off the board and went for the 72 Olympics because of everything that was going on there and the Russians beating the Americans sure. and the hostages. It was right. like, going, yeah, that's probably about as bad as it gets that on television. That was uh, the Munich Olympics. The Munich Olympics, yeah. 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 yeah okay, interesting. Yeah, th that, that would be a very unique vote there. Thank you very much. All right, and I'm going to go back to beer for this last one on Random Shots. Sure. You can go either best or worst cheap beer of all time. Best or worst. Best or worst. Um, I think... For the value, the keywords yes, the best cheap beer. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, they won the blue ribbon, so I got to give it to Pabst. Uh, PBR is yeah. Why? Why did that resonate? Can you explain the 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 rebirth of PBR? What brought that on in your mind? I, I would say the rise of hipsterism for okay. sure. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're they're always looking to take something from the past and and maybe. I say they as if they're they're monolithic, but in general, you yeah. know, this is what I've observed anyway, mm -hmm. and you know, trying to make it cool again, right? And uh, you know, you go, you go to a few dive bars, and mm -hmm. maybe they're becoming a little bit cooler, and then like PBR is in everyone's hands, and yeah. uh, you know, I started drinking it again after not drinking it for probably twenty years. That sounds about right. Yeah. And then I, I I was like, you know what? This isn't too bad. bad. <laughs> this isn't too bad. And the other thing I'll, I'll admit to, uh, it is a mass market sort of cheaper beer, mm -hmm. but there's something about it. Maybe the marketing even got to me, mm -hmm. but if I'm on the beach, I'll still have a nice Corona. Okay. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm going to go with my worst first. Ming, there is a photo of a beer can. I don't even know. I may stump the panel on this one. What? You never realized about that, did you? No, I did not. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to about the middle 80s. I'm in college at this point, just getting started. Sure. And there it is. And I remember seeing it and literally it was like about four ninety nine a case. I mean, you want to talk about and it was terrible. Oh, I mean it was just awful. The can, from what I seen online, it's like the can alone, if you got it like a Oh, I a, bet it's worth something. Yeah, it's worth something. Yeah. Exactly. But the beer itself, do not recommend it. I mean, wow. When I when Milwaukee's best was better than that, you yeah. gotta go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh it's not good. Yeah, I will give you one one other one uh that I I found was a, a cheap Cheap beer, a really cheap beer, but it was mm -hmm. good, is uh, from Genesee, Jenny Cream Ale. All right, oh, okay, yeah. They're based I out of that. Rochester, New yeah. York. And uh, when I was in college, that was, I guess, the cheap beer du jour. Right. And so we would always get, but not even like, uh, you know, six pack. We, you know, we'd get like the 30 pack, the jumbo. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and, and you know, there's there's still cheap beer out there yeah. performing. Just earlier today, I saw a place with Narragansett. That's another cheap one. Yeah, I've never that, tried uh, that, though. Yeah. Um, uh, Listen, it's not going to be a big cost investment for you to try it. Okay, I can put it all right, that that's good to know. All right, then, yeah, if I don't like it, there you go. Clean the toilet. There you go. At least there you go. <laughs> I remember working at one of the radio jobs I had. I was in the Lehigh Valley for about three years, so I was introduced to Yingling uh, mm -hmm. right around the late '90s, mm -hmm. and Yingling had been around for a while, but yep. I didn't know. But up in the Lehigh Valley, that was the cheap beer, and I'm sitting there going, "Where's this been all my life?" I'm like going for cheap. And if you're in Eastern Pennsylvania, yeah. You don't even have to order it by Brandon. You go to a bar and just say, give me a lager. You get, get you get, Yingling. Yeah, you get I found lager. that out. I found that out like back then. I mean, that was an incredibly affordable. And you're sitting there going, okay, I can drink cheap and enjoy this. Yep. I'm happy. I, I, you're, you're not wrong. That is 
probably bang for your buck, mm -hmm. you know, and to the point that I didn't even think of it as a cheap beer, but you're you're right. I mean, it, it is definitely cheaper than craft beer for sure. Yeah. But but they actually position themselves as America's oldest independent brewery, which is true. They've mm -hmm. been brewing since the 1800s. Yeah. And um, uh, I'll actually share this for, for your viewers and listeners. This is our Shrewsbury Lager right here. Yeah, I'll put this okay. up so this way we can have it on camera and you can take a look at it. There you so, go. So that's that's uh, an amber lager. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the particular style is called a Vienna lager. Okay. But I had a few inspirations for this. Okay, one of them was Sam Adams' original Boston Lager. Mm -hmm. One of them is Brooklyn Lager. And the third... And that's another company we didn't bring up. That's another one right yes. around 1990. They got they, their start, and you know, here they are 30 years later. You're right on the board, man. Yeah. They, they incorporated in 89. They started shipping in 90. Yeah. You're right there. And then now they're 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 huge today. Yeah, big they, time. They actually got uh, partially acquired by the Japanese beer giant Kirin. They make Ooh, a beer that okay, comes yeah. here. Kirin Ichiban, we see that mm -hmm, sometimes. Definitely. Uh, uh, particularly at Asian restaurants. But... Um, and they did that. They bought a 24% stake in Brooklyn because what that what that does is, number one, under the U.S. Uh, independent brewery uh, rules, mm -hmm. Brooklyn is still classified as an independent brewery. 25% okay. triggers, you know, uh, corporate ownership. And then in Japan, uh, it helps uh, Brooklyn get distributed in Japan where they have a policy of Japanese beer first. So now Kieran can say Brooklyn is a Japanese beer. Oh, so that's it, a win-win. It is oh a win-win. Yeah. So actually those two beers, the Sam Adams Boston Lager and the Brooklyn Lager, along with the one you just mentioned, Yingling mm -hmm. Lager, those three... I kind of drew up a triangle and said, what do mm -hmm. I like about each of them? Mm -hmm. And sort of tried to reverse engineer a beer right in the middle. And that's our Shrewsbury Lager. What I could tell you is for our non-craft beer drinkers, mm -hmm. this one does the best. It's the most accessible for those reasons. How long did it take to get that formula right? Because if you're cherry picking between three beers, I'm sure there was a lot of sampling and a lot of this. That's the fun part about making beer, Rob. Right? <laughs> it's all the taste testing. You got it, brother. Um, yeah, I, I'd say we probably went through a good dozen recipe formulations right. before we, we settled on the one because, you know, it's not like people publish their recipes. No, so, of uh, you know, you're, you're trying to do it by taste and trial and error. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, what do I like about this? Okay, I like the bite. I like the aftertaste. Mm -hmm. taste i like the mouth feel okay i like that from here but i like mm -hmm. this from this one so uh you're trying to figure out which grains to use mm -hmm. in which quantities right then which hops to use in what quantities and when to add the hops and uh you know what temperature with the water a lot of variables mm -hmm. so uh we think this version uh which obviously if we went to market with it it's a version we like best, yeah, right? obviously <laughs> yeah but uh but it's 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 on tap at Probably, if we were to leave here, a stone's throw ten different places, and uh, and that's what we're finding is mm -hmm. for those people that aren't craft beer drinkers, this beer can be the gateway drug. <laughs> I like the sound of that. I'll leave you with one last question: What is the goal to go nationwide? I mean, mm -hmm. I know it's it's kind of jumping the shark a little bit, yeah, because you're just getting out here now locally, yep. But do you have a goal in your head to say maybe in this many years I yep. can see this being a national beer? No, very fair question. Um, what I would say is right now we're in two states. Mm -hmm. We're in New Jersey and New York. But still, two pretty predominant states to be in. Yeah, and, and two high population states Absolutely. that could hopefully translate to moving a lot of beer. Right. So I could tell you that our plans going forward are more city-based than states in this sense. Uh, Philadelphia, okay, uh, Boston, mm -hmm. Chicago, Washington, D.C., along with the state of Connecticut. Those are the five next markets we'll be going in. Okay. And then beyond that, you're going to see a big jump because then we're going to go down to Florida. Nice. Okay. okay. And then once we're in Florida, we're actually going to then start working our way up and down the coast till we meet in the middle, I don't know, South Carolina somewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's our plans. Uh, no immediate plans to go west beyond Chicago. Okay. And the reason there is those cities all have lots of New Yorkers and New Jerseyans that have relocated there for very work true. or school. Very, very and true. And if they see a brand that reminds them of home, mm -hmm. I think something can happen there. It'll probably be a while before we get to California. Mm -hmm. I, I, I might blow your mind with this. We're going to be in other countries before we're in the rest of the states. Now, how did you set that up in your mind? Let's sure. Put it that way. So, uh, and some of these conversations have already happened, by the way. Oh, that's great. But, but uh, cr American craft beer mm -hmm. is one of the best exports that America has. Wow. The demand is high, even in traditional beer 
making and drinking countries like Germany and the UK. I mean, mm-hmm. they have their own oh, thousands yeah. year tradition of brewing. They still like what we have in terms of American innovation. Hmm. And then you've got countries like Australia and China and Italy where they can't get enough American craft mm-hmm. beer. So there are craft beer distributors there that would love to import American brands. Right. These are conversations we've had and more than likely will be in five other countries before we're in all 50 states. Wow. Yeah, I know it's crazy, but uh, you know, you think about it from California, right? California right. might have five of the 10 best craft breweries. So they're not in a rush to bring in a New Jersey brewery right now. Fair enough. But uh, but if somebody else wants to, right. we'll certainly be willing to work with them. <laughs> Go to the website for Ross Brewing because just the love of the names you talk about, the Manasquan, the Shrewsbury, the Navisink, all their brews named after little areas that you might know in New Jersey if you're around the Jersey Shore, that is for sure. And the harvest is out right now, just in time for the holidays. It is a wonderfully semi-dry cider, no aftertaste, just enough spice, and it gives you that holiday feel for it. So I highly recommend this, by the way. Thank you, Rob. And oh, one more uh, Point Blank Podcast happens here through a shared universe. Uh, night and time again is... Wednesday nights, 8.30. 5.30 Pacific. That's right. John, thank you so much, brother. Thanks for having me on, Rob. Absolutely. That's a wrap for this week. I'm Rob Akampora. We'll be back on Thursday night. i uh, got a really cool guest, I believe, Henry Hall, who's singer-songwriter from the indie music team, but he has a very famous pair of parents. Check out my Facebook page. Find out more about that. Until next time, take care. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.